In Los Angeles, a serial killer eludes the police for months. The night stalker strikes at random and kills at will. The terror he inspires is enormous. The clues he leaves behind are slight. But they're all detectives have to track him down. Investigators at the scene of a strangling rely on an experimental technique to raise invisible clues. They have only one chance to get it right. If they fail, a killer will go free. Using first-hand accounts, reconstructions and video footage from the emergency services, this film is based on the case files of America's murder detectives. It is their job to catch the criminals turning fleeting prints into lasting impressions. Despite their familiarity with death, Los Angeles murder detectives were chilled by the scene they encountered in the affluent suburb of Whittier on the 29th of March, 1985. The ransacked house told them that burglary was the primary motive. A video recorder, video camera, and much of the couple's jewelry was taken. But the perpetrator also had a taste for blood. Vincent Zazara had been killed by a 22 caliber bullet. His wife, Maxine, had been shot in the head and mutilated. The forensics team went to work, but wouldn't find many clues. Although the killer had plundered the house with reckless abandon, he had taken care to protect his identity. Technicians dusting for fingerprints concluded that the intruder had worn gloves. Whoever had committed these murders left few traces behind. The bullets were too damaged to be of use. After hours of scouring the house for clues, detectives came up empty-handed. The killer, it appeared, had got away with it. But he hadn't covered all his tracks. Beneath an open window, detectives found his point of entry. There were distinct footprints in the soil. One of the two prints belonged to the house owner, Vincent Zazaro. The other appeared to be that of the killer. Technicians sprayed the print with a fixative, then poured plaster into the indentation. The shoe print was lifted from the ground and sent for analysis. At the sheriff's crime lab, forensic expert Gerald Burke examined it. I was asked to check pattern details, uh, size, uh, take measurements of the casts of the impressions, and to see what kind of information I could get uh, from, from those uh, shoe impressions uh, with regard to uh, manufacture, uh, make of the shoe, size of the shoe, uh, things of that nature. The more Burke could learn about the shoes, the better idea detectives would have about the man who wore them. Burke knew the plaster cast was from a trainer, but he couldn't work out what make it was. In all his years of experience, Burke had never come across a print like this. It wasn't in their reference library of tread patterns, and he couldn't find it in the shops. It had to be newly released, or a make not usually available in America. Either way, the print, like the spent bullets, led detectives to a dead end. No, we didn't. Well, I don't know, but we're pretty young. Without a source of comparison, Burke's analysis couldn't move the investigation forward. The Zazara murders wasn't the only case that had the sheriff's office puzzled. At the same time, detectives were trying to make sense of another death that had occurred less than two weeks before and just five miles away in Rosemead. No 
Maria Hernandez arrived home late one night and came face to face with the barrel of a gun. Inside the maisonette, her housemate, Dale Okazaki, heard the gunshot. She died almost instantly. Can you tell me what happened? Maria Hernandez had been lucky. The keys in her hand deflected the bullet. She played dead until the attacker left. She told investigators that the killer was a thin Hispanic man in his 20s dressed all in black. He had black, bulging eyes, hollow cheeks and rotting teeth. Hernandez had no idea why he wanted her and her housemate dead. How tall was he? As tall as I am, tall. The case went nowhere and then, in an equally random way, the Zazaras were killed. The 22 caliber bullets from both crimes were sent to the ballistics lab for comparison. But they were too distorted to positively link them to the same gun. Even so, Detective Gil Carrillo of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office drew a connection between the murders. We had Maria Hernandez, who's surviving victim in the Hernandez case. You have her giving us a physical description and a drawing of an individual that assaulted her. We have a particular caliber gun. In the Zazara case, we have no physical description, but we have a shoe print. And we have the same caliber gun. Not only did he see a connection between these two crimes, Carrillo believed they were part of a much bigger pattern. For weeks, violence had been on the rise in Los Angeles County, a 4,000 square mile area of 88 towns. Night after night, the toll of murders, sexual assaults and abductions grew. The media was in a frenzy, reporting crime after crime. And with each episode, the public fear swelled. The crime lab worked overtime to process the evidence gathered at the various crime scenes without much success. And until you had enough physical evidence or conclusive evidence, it's difficult to sell everybody that one man was committing all the crimes that were, had been committed up, the, up until that time. Before he could prove his theory, Carrillo needed a clearer pattern to emerge he wouldn't have to wait long. In the weeks following the Zazara murders, seven victims across the county were woken in their beds. Women were bound with handcuffs, thumb cuffs or electrical cords before being sexually assaulted. Houses were turned upside down, valuables stolen. People didn't feel safe in their own bedrooms. Everyone was sleeping lightly. In early June, just three streets from the Zazara's house, a police officer's wife was woken up. She thought she heard a window opening. Someone was in the house.
couple moving about, the prowler slipped away. The husband called the sheriff's department. In the daylight, investigators found gouge marks where the burglar broke in. The police officer pointed out to them the flower bed where he'd covered some evidence with a shoebox. Beneath it was the imprint of a trainer. The waffle pattern was familiar. It looked yeah, it just like, like the tread of the footprint found outside the Zazara's house. This was the break detectives had been waiting for. If this print matched the print found at the Zazara murders, it would support Carrillo's theory that one man was stalking LA's neighborhoods. But if that were true, it meant that for a year, a lone predator had defied LA's brightest detectives. Now that forensic expert Gerald Burke had a basis for comparison, he examined the two plaster casts taken from the crime scenes. He concluded that the prints were made by shoes of the same style, but not necessarily the same shoe. Because both prints were left in coarse soil, Burke was unable to identify the subtle marks that make each shoe unique. Things like little nicks and cuts and scratches or, or something that can be used as, as an identification, uh, more or less like a fingerprint uh, in, uh, in one shoe sole uh, to another. This was of little help to detectives. In a region which was home to some 7.5 million people, they couldn't track a man by his tread marks alone. But it was all they had to go on, and it kept showing up again and again. Following the Zazara murders, the same waffle pattern was also found at the scene of a murder at Monterey Park and was stamped in blood inside the home of a severely beaten old woman in Monrovia. Burke had three casts and one shoe print to work with. The crimes remained unsolved. The shoe prints remained a mystery. Then a student on a summer job casually walked by a lab table and made a pivotal observation. And she said, oh, that's an Avia. And everybody just stopped and looked at her and said, are you sure? And she said, yeah, I got a pair in my trunk. So she, comes, she goes to the trunk of her car and pulls out this pair of Avia shoes, and that's when everything broke loose. Avia was a new make, which explained why Burke's department hadn't any information on them. In order to learn everything they could about the shoe, investigators went to the Avia headquarters in Portland, Oregon. The company's designer identified the style of trainer that had made the prints. Burke pressed for more information. I asked him to be a little bit more specific, and he said that, that he actually designed that shoe and, and that uh, he had a patent on that, that particular uh, shoe sole design and that uh, there were no other patterns that were, that were close. The pattern was from an aerobics trainer that had only been in the shops for four months. In fact, only 1,300 pairs had been manufactured. Avia provided Burke with a number of soles from the factory so that he could accurately determine the size of the shoe that left the print. The rate of motion and the texture of the ground can greatly distort the impression. The only way to size the shoe was to compare tread patterns. Down here in the, in the bottom of the shoe, actually the mid portion of the shoe, you'll see that there are, are a number of chevrons. And these chevrons actually increase in number with the increasing shoe size. And the plaster casts, although they weren't uh, uh, good enough quality to record the, the Avia logo, um, they were good enough quality to allow me to count these, these pattern elements, these pattern details. After counting the lines on the plaster casts, Burke was able to identify every cast and print he had as coming from a size 11 and a half shoe. When he examined the marketing material from the manufacturer, he realized what a crucial discovery he'd made. 
Of the 1,300 pairs of this style manufactured, only six had been delivered to shops in Los Angeles. And of those six, only one was size 11 and a half. In the country as a whole, only a handful of men owned size 11 and a half Avias. Carrillo's improbable theory of a single killer was now a real possibility. When you start throwing the odds of more than one person wearing that particular model and size of shoe, it becomes, uh, it narrows it down quite a bit that not more than one person is committing the crimes. When you have physical descriptions coupled with physical uh, shoe prints, you've got, uh, I mean, that's a neon sign saying, come get me, that's one man. A task force of detectives was organized to catch the night stalker. Carrillo teamed up with Frank Salerno, who has extensive experience of hunting some of LA's most deadly serial killers. The task force grew in size as evidence accumulated. At one point, we had about 75 investigators working in the bureau at that time, and we were using one third of them just to investigate the Night Stalker series. The Night Stalker held Los Angeles in a reign of terror. Night after night, people were attacked in their own homes. The pressure to solve the case was tremendous, but until murder detectives uncovered the predator's identity, they couldn't calm the public. Gun sales went up, burglar alarm systems went up. Everybody was locking their windows and doors during a very, very warm summer. And you're talking about something that just took over the entire county of Los Angeles. The police took to the streets in force. Detectives went door to door in the areas where the night stalker had struck, hoping that someone would recognize him. They found nothing but petrified residents and at night, people weren't opening their doors to anyone. Sergeant John Yarborough was responsible for collecting evidence connected to the crimes. In one house, I found a couple who had abandoned sleeping in their bed. They'd created dummies in the bed. The husband was sleeping routinely in the garage, and the wife was sleeping behind a television with the portable, portable uh, telephone. I mean, that was the kind of fear and panic that um, developed over this case. Whether he killed his victims or let them live seemed as random as the rest of his behavior. Those who survived his attacks described, as Maria Hernandez had, a tall man with bulging eyes. He was saturated in a rank, leathery odor. With the help of an identikit, a police artist created a likeness of the man who had attacked them. Thinner, thinner in the bridge. Thinner top lip. Do you right. Did he have a mask? Oh, mustache? Any facial hair? Looks good. Is that good to you? Looks good. I think that's him. Detectives knew what the night stalker looked like, but he thwarted every effort to find him. His unpredictability made his next move impossible to anticipate. Most serial killers conform to a regimented routine. This one seemed to work at random. He hit neighborhoods all over Los Angeles. His victims, both men and women, varied in age, race and economic status. What we had was a man that sometimes used a gun, sometimes used a knife, sometimes used blunt force trauma, some he raped, some he didn't, some he strangled, some he just stomped to death, some he robbed, some he didn't. The only thing he never changed was his shoes. And though murder detectives could track the killer by his shoe prints, they always lagged one step behind him. On the 5th of July, they followed his tracks to the affluent suburb of Sierra Madres. Dad! Daddy! That morning, 16-year-old Brittany Bennett woke up in an odd position. She had a searing Daddy! headache. 
What happened? While the Bennett family slept just feet away, Brittany had almost been beaten to death with a tire wrench. She remembered nothing about the attack, but the familiar calling card was there. The brutality of the crimes showed the killer's lack of remorse and his delight in causing death. I would say that he's a very good example of the, the predator type offender who clearly just does not care about the victims uh, that he comes in contact with and he achieves a a degree of thrill from it that motivates him. Now is he intelligent and cunning and clever? Well, he was certainly clever enough. The unpredictable night stalker held both the police and the public in his thrall. The police task force wasn't enough. If detectives were going to capture this serial killer, they needed to extend their investigation. Detectives made a video for LA County's 63 police departments. On the tape, Carrillo laid out the evidence gathered from the crime scenes. The suspect was a young Hispanic male who always wore avias. An expert cat burglar, it was impossible to tell if his primary motive was killing or robbery. As the body count grew, a few patterns emerged. He seemed to target yellow or beige houses. He sometimes drew pentagrams at the crime scenes. By early August, the Night Stalker was suspected of killing 13 people and attacking 10 others. His activity in and around Los Angeles seemed to be accelerating. The police were braced for his next assault. And then, nothing. For the first time in months, nights were passing peacefully. But not for long. On the 18th of August, the night stalker struck again, this time in San Francisco. Peter and Barbara Pan, a couple who lived in a yellow house, were found murdered. It was the typical pattern, forced entry in the middle of the night, brutal murders, pentagrams and stolen valuables. The unpredictable predator had just expanded his territory by 380 miles. Now the entire state was under his grip. Where he'd strike next, no one could predict. Diane Feinstein, the mayor of San Francisco, called a press conference to calm the citywide hysteria. But she divulged sensitive forensic information detailing the Avia trainers and the ballistic findings. Detectives believed, like many serial killers, the night stalker was following his case in the media. All along, he had enjoyed toying with them. Now that he knew exactly what they had on him, he had an added advantage. He was bound to change his pattern and discard his signature footwear. But a few good things did come out of the media hype. San Francisco newspapers publicized the jewelry stolen from the pans. A $10,000 reward was offered for the capture of the night stalker and informants started to come out of the woodwork. One told police that a man called Rick from El Paso had given her a bracelet and some rings. He was very tall. He had very like the shoulders. description of the night stalker, Rick had terrible teeth, smelled bad, and talked constantly about the greatness of Satan. Police found out that his last name was Ramirez. Police now knew who he was, but they still had to find and capture him. The Los Angeles phone directory was full of men named Richard and Rick Ramirez. When Ramirez's name came up, 
They pulled all the Ramirez's that had been arrested, which there were numerous of them, Richard Ramirez's, and they physically checked it just like you would by eye and made that identification. Once they established which Ramirez they were after, surveillance personnel were deployed all over Los Angeles. They concentrated on places Ramirez was known to frequent. One of those places was the bus station. Uniformed officers and undercover cops swarmed all over the station. But because they were looking for a man trying to leave LA, they didn't pay attention to passengers who were arriving. Ramirez, returning from Tucson, spotted the undercover officers before they saw him. He slipped out of the bus station and went to a local shop to buy some breakfast. He quickly realized that he was the center of attention. El Matador, they whispered, the killer. The chase was on. Ramirez ran for his life along the motorway. He ran like a gazelle. He literally ran at a full sprint, uh, probably a good two, three miles. Kept going, went over 10-foot sound walls, crossed eight lanes of the five freeway right here. Uh. The fugitive made his way into a suburb in the east of Los Angeles. He saw his only way out but it wouldn't get him very far. Police intervened. The man they protected from attack was the man they'd been hunting for months, their prime suspect, Richard Ramirez. At the police station, all eyes moved to his shoes. They weren't Avias. The night stalker was too clever to wear those again. But they were size 11 and a half. As always, it appeared that the night stalker was still one step ahead. Both Gil Carrillo and his partner Frank Salerno believed that Richard Ramirez was the night stalker. But they didn't have the notorious trainers. To build their case, the detectives would need to carefully draw together the web of evidence. Their first task was to interview the suspect. His demeanor surprised them. Very soft-spoken. Uh, for a lack of a uh, lot of education, um, he was uh, well-spoken also. Uh, probably the thing that sticks in my mind the most is when you walk into a, an interview room with a, with a suspected killer, is you usually introduce yourself, you tell them who you are. And uh, they walked in and sat down, and he says, you're Frank Salerno. Ramirez knew of him from the Hillside Strangler case involving a pair of high-profile serial killers Salerno helped catch six years earlier. Detectives learned that their suspect had a vast working knowledge of serial killers throughout history. He knew all their names, their methods, and how they'd been captured. He'd closely followed the Night Stalker case in the media. Though he never admitted to any crimes, Ramirez engaged detectives in a conversation about LA's latest serial killer. He would talk to us in the third person. I didn't do this, but the Night Stalker might have done this. And the Night Stalker might have done this and this. And what do you think he'd have done over here? Ramirez never confessed, so investigators looked for hard evidence to tie him to the crime spree. Inside his wallet, they found a claim ticket for a piece of luggage at the bus station. Everything was removed and photographed. 
The bag contained a revolver and several kinds of ammunition, including 22 caliber cartridges. The shells and bullets collected from various crime scenes were taken to the ballistics lab to compare against those taken from the bag. They matched. Ramirez's fingerprints were found on some of the items confirming that the bag and its contents belonged to him. Most of the Night Stalker's surviving victims picked him out in an identity parade. The eyewitness accounts, ballistics, fingerprint and shoe print evidence provided police with enough evidence on which to arrest Ramirez for the Night Stalker crimes. Three years after the arrest, the case finally went to trial. By this time, police suspected that Richard Ramirez had killed 16 people and assaulted 11 others. The suspect seemed unrepentant. At one hearing, he had drawn a pentagram on the palm of his hand and waved it about, shouting, Hail Satan! Though no size 11 and a half Avia aerobic trainers were found among his belongings, it was the prints found at eight of the crime scenes that held the case together. They formed an irrefutable physical link between the string of burglaries, rapes and murders. Eyewitness testimony tied the man in court to other crimes, even when no print was present. The most expensive trial Los Angeles had ever seen ended after more than a year in victory for the prosecution. In November 1989, Richard Ramirez was sentenced to death 19 times. Ramirez was one of the most horrifying killers to terrorize America. But whether a killer takes many lives or only one, the motivation to kill remains the same. Murder is the ultimate selfish act.